Good morning, and welcome to Resurrection Episcopal Church. I'm Mother Leslie Stewart, and I'm so glad that you've joined us this morning. And thank you to everyone who came out this week to our Plant and Sip event. It was such a joyful time for us to be together after a whole year, and our hearts are full. So come now, let us gather for worship. You can find the service bulletin on our website and our Facebook page in the top of this live post. And once you have that, you have everything you need to begin worship. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you and also with me. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 8, starting at the 26th verse. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south of the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, 
he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get, to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom may I ask you? Does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Asatos, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. The psalm appointed today is Psalm 22. We will read it responsively by whole verse. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingships belong to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship all who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. Second reading, a reading from the first book John chapter 4, starting at the seventh verse. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this, if, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another. God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, 
that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast our fear, cast out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister who, whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Hey friends, have you had a busy week? This week, I joined a discussion with Father Chris Steele and his congregation, St. Christopher's, down in Dallas. He has a group called The Approach, where he discusses Sunday's readings, and you get to tune in to how two priests and the gathered community interact with the text. It was a lot of fun. Although there was no prep for the discussion, Father Chris and I both showed up knowing what passages we wanted to preach. Right away, he said he was going to preach on the passage from Acts about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. He said it's his favorite passage. And right away, I said I was going to preach from John about the vine and the branches. It's about abiding in Jesus. And that is something that I think that we have learned a little bit about in our time of sabbatical. When asked why we each chose those passages, Father Chris says that he is always drawn to preach from passages that have more of a story in it. And he loves the story of Philip and the early church trying to figure out how to go from Jerusalem and spread the good news like they were told to do. In the eunuch, the text leaves out what Philip said specifically to the Ethiopian eunuch, but when he's finished, that man wants to be baptized. I mean, that is exciting stuff. I, I mean, I actually started to think about midway through our discussion that maybe I should change what passage I was gonna preach on. 
because to me it was really clear to see what was happening there. In Acts 8, it says this. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading, that is the Ethiopian eunuch, was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, about whom may I ask you? Does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. We don't know what Philip said, but it would be odd for anyone to read that passage from Isaiah and think, you know what, that sounds good. I want to get on board with that. And then I told the people of St. Christopher's that for me, it was clear what was happening because of our work with trauma informed ministry. I think if the Ethiopian eunuch read about a man who was led to the slaughter. I think he read about a man who knew something about humiliation and denied justice, a man cut off from the earth and it resonated with him. We are the only ones who worship a post-trauma God. And I think Philip told him that good news, the news that God loves us so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to join us in our suffering and to die for us so that we could be raised to new life, new life with God. And I think that's what he wanted to be a part of. And why does it matter? What I like about the passage is that it shows what God is doing on both sides. We see how the word moved uh, in the Ethiopian eunuch. He was nudged by the spirit into a relationship with God, who, a God who understands suffering. And we also see what happens in Philip, which is the same in the life of every disciple. Philip made the choice to be obedient, to be obedient to what the spirit was telling him to do. He didn't have an evangelism plan. He wasn't an expert in any of those things, but he was obedient and he took that first step. And the secret of discipleship is that when you are obedient, you must be obedient first. Other things will open up to you, things you can't imagine. The spirit will, will reveal more of its power in your life at that point. It's like a whole nother level of the spiritual life opened up to Philip. He spoke to the stranger. He told him the good news about Jesus. He baptized the stranger. And then he got to see that the power of the spirit can even move disciples to other places. He leveled up. But like I said, I didn't change my mind. I still want to preach about that passage from the Gospel of John. And when they asked me how I choose passages, I said that for me, it's, it's not whether or not the passage itself has a clear, clearer story. It's about the story that emerges in my brain when I read the passage. I start with reading the congregation first, actually. It's about our common lived life and I determine what passage speaks most to us. So they said, okay, well, tell us about this passage in John and, and why should it matter? How does it affect our lives now? And I told them that I think the beauty of this passage is that it's like the myth of the Phoenix, that it's the end and the beginning and the beginning in the end, you know, this is the end in some ways of Jesus's ministry with his disciples in the way that they have known, right? But in the way it is the beginning of this whole unfolding drama that we have been talking about. The death, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension in which he draws all men to himself and the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. And that's what is happening in Acts. That's why the Acts readings are always paired here with the gospel readings in Easter. So we've been looking at the seven weeks of the Easter season. In the first three weeks, we looked at the post-resurrection appearances where Jesus is teaching his disciples about uh, how to live a resurrected life. And then in these final weeks, we're looking at how to live a life of intimacy with God, which is part of the resurrected life. 
And in John's Gospel, we're at the part that is called the Farewell Discourse. It's from chapters 14 to 17 in John's Gospel are the Farewell Discourse. So we're kind of right in the middle of it. And Jesus is walking to the cross now. These are his final teachings to his disciples. And he's telling them that he is not going to be with them anymore. And this is not a long drawn out or scriptural exposition where he is trying to clearly show them, make a point that this is what was foretold about him. No, this is a pastoral word from the Lord. They're very near Jerusalem and the cross now. And the disciples, even though they don't fully understand, are starting to get the gravity of the situation and they are sad. They're sad that Jesus won't be with them in the way that they've had him close, at least not for much longer. Here we see Jesus um, offering pastoral words of comfort about a vine and the vine grower. He's offering reassurances that what might feel like loss is actually for health and growth. You may have heard this passage preached from a, a fearful stance before. I, I know I did while I was growing up. It was like an admonition that if you don't continue to abide with Jesus, you'll be tossed into the fires of hell. But that is not what is going on in this passage. This is a word of comfort, assuring them, as it says at the end of the passage, that my father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is kind of a last will and testament. Jesus is telling his disciples what it is going to be like um, in coming days. And he's offering comfort, just as if he were laying on his deathbed, giving reassurances to his loved ones that love doesn't end. It is not that he is saying, if you wanna live, you better stay connected. What Jesus is saying is, don't worry. We will be together no matter what is about to happen. Your life itself will testify to your ongoing intimacy with me. Just the fruit of your life will show it. And it'll, the fruit of your life will happen as organically as a vine sp spreads and gives fruit. Anything you lose won't be lost. It is pruning for your growth and health. He's saying, take heart. I will be with you. In fact, I will be with you in a deeper, more intimate way than you can imagine now. You don't know it, but you are about to level up. Father Chris reminded me of a, of a book. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's Augustine's Confessions. On the surface, Augustine is confessing what a terrible sinner he is, which was true. He had a pretty colorful life. Uh, he was known for a, a lot of very colorful things that I wouldn't mention in mixed company. But then there is a line, uh, you know, you can get distracted by his description of how much of a sinner he is, but there is a line in there where he arrives at a truth after he confesses everything. He's speaking to God and he says, you are closer to me, even closer than I am to myself. And that's what it is to be baptized into the life of Jesus and have the Holy Spirit inside your heart. No one can separate you from that connection. It runs like a vine. Me, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and then God. Me and the connection with the Holy Spirit in me, which connects me to Jesus, and Jesus who is in God connects me to God. And why does that matter? I mean, what difference does it make to my life right now? Well, in the Gospel of John, there are seven I am statements. And you remember them. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd, etc. The I am statements are important because it's the name of God that we are taught. Remember Moses in the desert, God's presence manifests as the burning bush and it the bush burned, but was not consumed. And this fascinates Moses. So he turned aside to go look at it. And when he did, God asks something of Moses. He told him to go deliver his people, deliver them out of Egypt. And Moses, like most disciples, Moses said, hey, I am, <clears throat> I'm not your guy. 
I don't know enough. I don't speak well. I don't actually have any idea what I'm doing. Just like every single one of us, <laughs> especially when God asks something of us. But God didn't stop asking. And finally, Moses said, okay, if you want me to go, I will go. But who should I say sent me? And God said, I am. The name of the God who sends Moses and sends all of us is I am, which translated literally is I will be who I will be. Jesus using seven different I am statements in the Gospel of John is telling us that Jesus is God. And there are seven of these statements to mirror the seven days of creation. God is creating something new. Jesus brings about this new creation. And the seventh and the final I am statement is this. I am the true vine and fa my father is the vine grower. You staying connected, abiding in him, like a branch on the vine that, that bears fruit. It brings about this new creation that God is making and it allows God to make a new creation out of you and me. That's what Augustine learned. That's what Moses learned. That however he finds you is not how he leaves you. That you will be changed. You will be made new. And although that process may involve some pruning, which may feel painful at the time, it is for our growth. Jesus promises that he will never abandon us, even if it seems that he is going away. It is for the sake of abundant life and an intimate life with him that he faces the cross and the grave. But he gives us words of consolation and comfort this week. Meditate on them, tuck them into your heart. Abide in me as I abide in you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us affirm our faith using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed, saying together, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your words and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. 
Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, ruler all things, of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with me. If you have a birthday or anniversary coming up this week, please know that this prayer and blessing is for you, starting with birthdays. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And if you have a wedding anniversary, know this prayer and blessing is for you. All praise and blessing to you, God of love, source of blessing for married life. All praise to you, for you have created courtship and marriage, joy and gladness, feasting and laughter, pleasure and delight. May your blessing come in full upon them. May they know your presence in their joys and in their sorrows. May they reach old age in the company of friends and come at last to your eternal kingdom. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you and also with me. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we say.
We acclaim you, Holy Lord, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only son to be our savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners, freedom, to the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death, and in rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us, this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. And grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
for those of you who were not able to come by and pick up communion, we have this prayer of spiritual communion found on page seven in your service bulletin. Let us pray. In union, blessed Jesus, with the fruitful, I'm sorry, with the faithful gathered at every altar of your church, where your blessed body and blood are offered this day, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory, and particularly for the blessings given me. I believe that you were truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and I and since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. And let us gather our thoughts of thanksgiving with this post-communion prayer found in your service bulletin. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for being with us today. We were so glad that you joined us again. And please come back next Sunday at 1030. Until then, take care of yourself and one another. <laughs>